And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the multiple events that are happening at the same time today. This is the Civil and Environmental Engineering Seminar, but also it is the Friedman Family Visiting, so visiting Professional Program presentation. And today we are very happy to host uh, John Hooper, a friend, a great structural engineer, and a very gifted speaker. Um, the sponsors of this program are uh, the FEMA and the Friedman family, which their uh, uh, sponsorship is highly appreciated. The intention of this uh, visiting, scholar, visiting professional program is to bring academia and the practicing engineers together. And basically, we, when we work together, we can make wonders happen. And the intention is to promote that working together is under the umbrella of Earthquake Engineering Research Institute, ERI, which is a nonprofit membership organization that connects multidisciplinary professionals to reduce the earthquake risk. It uh, has multiple lines of uh, work. Uh, first, it wants to advance earthquake engineering and science. It wants us to understand the um, impact of earthquakes and find ways that we can reduce that impact on um, our infrastructure and humankind. So with that introduction about the program, I would like to now present our speaker. Um, the name is John Hooper. John is a book, but can be easily explained in a few, one word. John is a caring engineer. John and I go back, I know John for like 20 years now, uh, mm -hmm. has been a, it's been a pleasant experience. Very knowledgeable, has been always positive in approaching the problem that he has in hand. Um, he is at MKA as a senior principal. The company is a lead uh, consulting engineers in designing buildings, earthquake resistant. And uh, they are, as I was mentioning in the other room, they are those who actually tackle problems that are very hard for other companies to uh, go for. I made a couple of notes and I'm trying to look into these to make sure I cover everything that I have. John <laughs> was during the golden era of Berkeley. He's a graduate of Berkeley. Yep. And worked with, uh, was, uh, got his education uh, from the giants of earthquake engineering and structural engineering. Uh, 30 years of practice, 20 years in the area of performance-based earthquake engineering. Uh, today's lecture is on this subject, which is again, terrific. As I mentioned earlier, the singer and the song is very delightful to be listened to. Uh, he is the chair of ASC 7's um, seismic subcommittee, and he's also at MEHERP. He is at AISC for the technical committee. So he has a lot of hands in these different uh, technical committees that are gonna help shape our future codes. Um, I think I can speak in length about John. I can go, by the way, there was one thing we're, about we're good. I'd like to mention. John, John is so caring that his voicemail gets updated every day. You wanna call John, his voicemail says what is the current date and you can leave a message. So he's very attentive to his, his friends and people who is he, and people who who he works with. Again, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to give it back to Mo that she can go ahead and present the speaker, or we can actually go directly to John and he can listen to his comments. Great. Am I okay to share my screen, Mo? Am I good? Yeah, I am. I am. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. It, it should show the presentation. It should show the title slide. Is that a thumbs up, the team? Good, okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Farzine. And as you said, we're, we, we're friends and colleagues for quite some time. And uh, as I said in the previous, I'll call it pre-happy hour, uh, I knew Farzine when he was just a student. And so, and then he's come a, a great long ways and uh, UCI is lucky to have him as part of the team. And I know you guys do great work with him and the rest of the professors down at your great university. Okay, so as the title indicates and was presented, I'm gonna talk about performance-based seismic design, what we're doing today, and what, we, what I see as a vision of future. And I think some of this work you guys might be doing as part of your work at UCI. So some of, some of you may have seen some of this and you may actually be using some of this already. 
it hasn't made its way into the mainstream of the world that I live in when I talk about the vision for the future. But we'll go to that and we'll see how that how that unfolds. First, I need to talk about ERI. Farzine did a great job introducing it, so I'll go through this quickly. It's been around since 1948. That's a key point of this slide. And it includes anybody and everybody that cares about earthquake engineering, from the scientists down to the social scientists, the whole range of people that care about what happens when it, about earthquake and how the built environment reacts. Uh, three missions, three statements that they, they live by is advancing earthquake engineering, improving understanding the impacts of earthquakes, clearly, and then advocating to change and reduce the losses and the effects of an earthquake. So it's a pretty clear mission. And the group that is involved at your campus, that's the, the stewards of ERI at your, your ERI club, this is what they're trying to help instill with you and, and the other students. Uh, why do ERI? I've been doing ERI for <clears throat> over 30 years uh, to connect. It's a great way to connect with other professionals. I learn all the time uh, at every meeting I go to or every uh, ERI spectra I read, uh, et cetera. And you have a chance to lead. Um, and I like this image here in the bottom right where this undergrad students get to build and break buildings. Doesn't get any cooler than that. And I know a handful of you have done this before. I'm hoping we can get back to real in-person EERI meetings so we can break more buildings. It's a fantastic thing to do as a student. Again, I already mentioned this, who are they? It's anybody and everybody dealing with earthquakes from A to Z. Uh, one of the flagship things that they do and they've been doing it, it really be began EERI back in the late forties is to learn from earthquakes, go out, see what mother nature gives us, how it affects the built environment and then fix it moving forward. So we don't make the same mistake twice, if at all possible. And ERI has been the key, the group that leads in my estimation the world because ERI is a worldwide organization. It has members across the globe and they're the leaders in this whole activity after 70 years of doing it. There's also a program that allows students and young professionals to do a, a learning from earthquakes travel program where you take a week or more to go to different places and learn about their infrastructure, how they do their earthquake engineering design and construction. And it's kind of a, a, a great opportunity to learn from the local experts. While we do sing things in a similar fashion around the globe, there are differences. And it's always great to learn about what they do and why they do it. So as you can see in these pictures here, a lot of these are young, or either students or young professionals that go out and do this program that's available. Uh, student membership, what do you get out of it? You get people like me. You can judge afterwards whether this is a good thing or not. Uh, the competitions, again, uh, the paper competitions, the cool building things that we hopefully we can get back to. And there's other graduate fellowships you can, you can go for, et cetera. And so there's a lot of things you can do. If you want to dig deep into very technical stuff, there's the earthquake spectra articles are fantastic. They're very deep, written by very sharp people but you can learn a lot from them as well. So there's a lot of benefits of, of student membership. What do you do after graduation? Some of you are still hanging in there to finish up your undergrad or your master's or PhD. Uh, you can take this learning and join the Student Leadership Council. I'm not sure if, if I forget, the people I talked to earlier had done that. The people I met on the SLC are fantastic young uh, students that will become great either professionals and or academicians, researcher types. You can join member committees. You can get involved in regional chapters. There's a bunch of other things. Uh, and so there's activities to do right after you graduate as well. So that's an opportunity for you to continue your connection with EERI if that's a, a, a passion that you have. And the, I mentioned briefly regional chapters. They're, they're, they're around the world, but they're a lot focused on the West Coast. Uh, no surprise there. That's where a lot of the seismicity is. And so as you graduate and go off to wherever you go, whether it's you're teaching or you're working or whatever, there's opportunity to get involved in a regional chapter. We have one in Seattle. We call it Washington, but it's really a Seattle-based uh, chapter of EERI. And to, to, as to augment or to, to help promote staying involved, they give you the first year free and then reduce rates for the next four years. So there's an incentive to wanting you to stay involved. They want to keep growing the group and what it's how we can backfill as people retire, like I will at some days relatively soon. 
the younger generation can come and take over and uh, they really want to incentivize that transition. And if you want to learn more about it, edri.org. You can go find out and read lots and lots and lots about it. Okay, that's it. this is an additional far as you can do this. Well, I, I had a little bit more slides to show as part of my presentation about the EDRI. So with that, as a backdrop and why I'm here, et cetera, let's talk about the topic I'm here for, and that's PBSD, performance-based seismic design. Something I've been working on as, as Farzine as mentioned for the last 20 years. Now it's getting closer to 25. My first PBD job was 1997. And not all of you were born then, which is very telling, which is very telling, which is fine. What do we do today? Um, what, what you typically do when you get out of school, you do what I call as code prescriptive design. That would, what does that mean? It's, it's designed that you follow the books, the codes and the standards that are required by state, by law. You have, the IBC is adopted by local state and local jurisdictions that you have to follow. When you're designing for seismic, you it then refers to ASC7. In this case, this is ASC716. So that's what, that's what we are required to do. But what does this do? What do these codes and standards require? It provides a minimal acceptable lateral strength and stiffness of a building for earthquake. It's, it, 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 you follow the rules and out comes a, a, a building that is hopefully gonna work well in the event of an earthquake. That's the goal. That's what we have to do legally. Uh, it, it stresses the minimum acceptable detailing practices. Detailing is how you put together members in uh, concrete, steel, wood, timber, so that they behave and can, can absorb the energy that's being imparted to them by the earthquake and the, and the deformations that they have to undergo back and forth. Uh, and it also does something that most of us don't think about as undergrads or even grad students. It talks about stuff that isn't structural. It talks about what we call the non-structural elements, the ceiling tiles, partitions, sprinkler lines. It tells us how to, the cladding on the outside of the building, how to attach it, how to make sure it can move with the building and not fall off or break or something like that and hurt and or kill someone. So that's part of it. But so we follow all these rules that are in these documents, these codes and standards, but we, it's presumed that we provide acceptable performance the actual performance is never actually evaluated when you do a design. You don't have to do this. You don't have to understand. You want to understand how it's going to work, but you don't have to actually check it at a, at a higher level of performance. Okay. That's where PBSD comes into play. If you really want to understand how something is going to perform, how it's going to behave, you want to go to the next level. And that is what PBSD. What is it? It really comes down to something in my mind is very simple. And, and it, it very logically explained, I hope, and fairly straightforward. It's basically an approach to obtain buildings that perform either better than a code performing building, a code performing building is like you follow the recipe in the two documents I showed before. So you want to you want to get better performance. I was just on a call before this one, where we were talking just about that. They wanted us to start thinking about using performance based design so that they could understand how well the building is performing and maybe want to enhance it, make it better, which is really a cool thing. So we'll likely use these techniques on that building uh, moving forward. But there's a whole other host of owners and developers that want to design and build a building that doesn't meet the code directly, doesn't meet all the different equations and requirements that are in the books, but they want to do something differently. But we have to prove that it could perform as well as a code prescriptive design building. And so that's the technique that is used that is considered not just by MK, but all the engineers that do typically any high rise building. This is the, this is the way we've been doing it now for the last 20 plus years uh, to try to do that. Like anything else in the world, uh, we were doing this for like almost 15 years, not quite, but almost 15 years and we realized what we, I was doing at MKA and what other firms were doing wasn't quite doing the, the spectrum and the range of approaches was thought to be too broad. So we decided to write down some guidelines, not rules, but guidelines. And this is a very subtle difference, but very important difference. So in 2010, and this is the 2017 version of the talk we can see here, is the Peer TBI, Peer Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center, 
TBI's tall building initiative, and you can see the title and the rest of it. So that was written mainly, not always, but mainly by people in Northern California and a few guys from the state of Washington. That'd be me. LA has a very similar version, and, and, and I'm sure Farzine has worked on this version. It's a similar document. They're very, they're very compatible. <laughs> they're not identical, but they're very compatible, doing the same thing. And so what they're trying to do is write guidelines down so that we have better consistency in dealing with performance-based design of these very tall and important buildings. As I mentioned, anything over 240 feet, and these are just a handful of buildings that we have done, uh, that were designed and analyzed using these performance-based seismic design techniques. The, my current estimate of how many that have been done on the West Coast by engineering companies like ours is close to 100. So that's been a lot of buildings. Uh, and we had a fantastic building boom right before 2009 and then right after 2012. So we see these buildings uh, and it becomes, uh, it becomes the landmarks in the communities that we live in. Uh, let me talk next then about what is the process of the, the steps, if you will, what's the flow chart? And the flow chart guys is very simple. And it, 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 there's a lot more to it than this, but at its core level, it's the first thing you do is you select your performance objective, meaning given an earthquake shake, and I'll talk about this in a minute, how do you want the building to look? How should the building perform? And the code gives us some guidance there that we have to at least meet. Then you do a preliminary design, right? You have to design something and then I, I'll, I'll share some what we do to do that. Then you assess the performance capability, meaning you do a nonlinear response history analysis using a lot of earthquake shaking and, and very sophisticated modeling. Just so you know, for you PhD students listening, we don't use open seas. <laughs> That's a program that is not as practical uh, in, a, in the world that I live in. The tools that we typically use these days are PERFORM, a CSI product. product. We're starting to use ETABs nonlinear, and then some firms use LS data. So that's how you assess the performance capability, you do the nonlinear analysis. If that preliminary design is acceptable, you're done. And if you meet all the criteria that you set, you're finished. If not, you just do a revised design and you do, you do a loop like this until you can answer the question yes. So at its highest level, at its core, the process is as simple as this. Again, there's a lot of nuances in each step of the way. Again, what are performance objectives? It's a ground shaking hazard in a terms of some percent of exceedance in 50 years. In the case for us, it's, it's not exactly this. It's 2% in 50 years. That's not exactly what we do. We actually do what is called a risk targeted maximum considered earthquake. So that, that exceedance probability ranges location by location. Uh, so uh, for example, um, for the MCE sub R, if you've been introduced to that terminology, this risk targeted maximum considered earthquake that's in the building codes, it ranges between 1,000 years to 2,500 years return period. That's the kind of ground shaking we're talking. And then for that performance level, thinking about that high level of shaking, that's a very intense shaking, that performance level will be collapse prevention. You could look at a more frequent earthquake, let's say an earthquake that occurs about every 50 years, you know, a uh, 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 50 year event. You want a different performance level. You want that performance level to be such that you can occupy the building immediately because you have no damage. Maybe some non-structural cracking, a few things like that, but that's it. So performance objectives are simply a, a marriage, a combination of a shaking level and what you want the building to perform like, okay? So what are the standard performance levels? It's, these have been around since uh, ATC 33. Farzine, you mentioned that earlier. This was developed back in the mid 90s. We still have them. And so these are the ones we still talk about today. And the two that, uh, actually all three that we, we actually look at in our design process in performance space these days is we, we do and evaluate what's called a service level earthquake. Given that shaking, when that return period is actually 43 years, which is a unique number, we want the building to be immediately immediate occupiable or immediate occupancy performance Again, everything's lights are on, everything's working, maybe some ceiling tiles come down and you're good to go. 
given the earthquake that's in the building code, which we call the design earthquake, we want the building to be life safe. And you can see in this cartoon that you see cracking here and there in the structural elements, we expect structural damage in this design earthquake level, but it's life safe. No one gets hurt. There's no serious injuries. Um, the building may be hopefully economically repairable, but may not be, but we want to protect life. And then given the MCE sub R, this big one, the one that we think is the biggest one we need to consider, we don't want the building to collapse and have major fatalities. You may have serious injuries, uh, uh, one or two life loss, but we don't want to have a, a complete collapse given this event that's a very strong shaking event. So those are the standard performance levels you have either heard about or you will hear about uh, after you get out in, into practice for those that go that route. If you think about these performance targets or levels, in a, think about it as a kind of a push over curve. A push over curve is, if for those of you who don't know, you, you push on the building, you laterally displace it, until such time as you get, you, the more and more you push it, the more deformation it sees, the more damage that will incur in the elements within the structure. So I've overlaid on this kind of uh, generic pushover curve, what these different performance levels may be along that curve. Well, if you're elastic, you're down here and you're, you're basically almost no shaking or in the wind load, you're completely operational. Nothing happens bad at all. For immediate occupancy, you might have a little bit of yielding, maybe a little bit, but not much. So you that this part of the pushover curve. At the design earthquake, you're at the um, you're at life safety. You yield it. You you have cracked elements and things are it, have gone post elastic, but you have a lot of reserve capacity before something bad happens. Here's cop's prevention. You have the you're you haven't collapsed. That's what this little guy over here is, but you're right before that. So you want to make sure that and it, all what I do and all what we do that we don't exceed this often, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Okay, the next image you see is about structural performance prediction. It's a really a marriage of, of a lot of different components here you see in the slide. I'm actually gonna start with the testing because the testing is where we understand member and component behavior. Without the testing that's been gone on for the last 30 or 40 years in earnest with the things we build today, and the testing that's continually happening today, which will hopefully continue for a long time, we need to understand this very well so that when we understand this, we can then understand the force displacement behavior of these members and components and understand the acceptance criteria for each one and create what we call a backbone curve that will then go into our structural model, member model, which you see here, then that goes into a global three-dimensional model that we shape through a, a series of earthquakes. And so it's a, it's a very much a, a, a compatible uh, relationship, symbiotic relationship, if you will, between the physical testing all the way back through the resulting analysis, back to physical testing. When we learn from analysis, we figure out what we need to do more testing on. And fortunately, our company has been involved uh, with testing for the last 25 years at different universities to try to understand behavior like how this column behaves or Composite, con, uh, composite show wall systems, et cetera. We've done a lot of that. So we're getting better at structural performance prediction. There's a lot more to learn. There's a lot better modeling we should do, a lot more testing, but we've come a long ways in the last 20, 25 years. That's structural performance now. The next portion though is non-structural. And this is the, the problem of today's approaches. Um, uh, as I'm sure that most, many of you might be aware, it counts for more than 7% of the earthquake economic losses when the earthquake does come. If somebody talks about a billion dollars, 700 million of that is non-structural. And you see in the picture here, this is the ceiling tiles came down, the ductwork came, got damaged, et cetera, et cetera. That accounts for a lot of it. Currently, there's not a very good way in the procedure I'm gonna show you in just a minute to actually cover the losses in a direct way to understand how much loss we'll have in non-structural because we're, the structural performance prediction I showed just prior talks about the structural system. It doesn't talk about the partitions and ceilings and piping and cladding. What we rely on is the anchors that the code requires of these systems is adequate. We'll protect it. As you can see in the, in the, again in the picture, in this case, it didn't quite do a job as well as it should. And so that's a, that's a, a a shortcoming, a shortcoming of our current approaches uh, 
in the in our performance based seismic design approach that we're following today. So let me step you through one. And this is if somebody asked me earlier today, what was one of the cooler ones I did? This would be one of the cooler ones I've done. I was working on this Salesforce Tower in San Francisco, the tallest building in the Bay Area, the tallest performance based office building on the West Coast. Uh, and if you haven't been up to the Bay Area, this, uh, it's a, in my humble opinion, is a shining beacon, literally, because the top 160 feet lights up as a lantern, and they could make it any color they want, uh, because it is a, uh, it's a lantern, fundamentally a lantern. So this is a very cool uh, showcase piece of the tower itself. What is this building? What are the details of the building? It's uh, the, the gravity system is structural steel columns and beams. This is so this uh, you know this is an office building. Uh, again, Salesforce is the uh, is the tenant the, of this building. Uh, so it's a steel office building floor framing system. The lateral system are concrete shear walls that surround the elevators and the stairs. And this is typical of a lot of the current high rise designs that have been handled been designed the last uh, fifteen to twenty years is a concrete core surrounded by floor framing to, to, to make up the rest of the system. So the, the, the seismic system that is doing all the work is this big concrete core box. And as you, as you may not know, elevatoring is key <laughs> to high rise design from a usability standpoint. And especially in office buildings where there's one elevator for every 50,000 square feet of building. So there's a lot of elevators in this building because there's a lot of square footage. So that's why this core is so big, they have so many elevators. So again, this is the lateral force resisting system. It's their concrete shore walls. They vary from four feet thick at the base to 22 feet thick at the top. All these white portions here represent our coupling beams over doorways. These are the energy dissipation elements. These do the most work in the building to absorb the earthquake energy that is that comes into the building at its base. Um, I'll go ahead and move on from that. So as I mentioned, um, let me take a back. We had ground motions developed because we're gonna do a nonlinear response history analysis that structural performance prediction. We have to create that model and do the, do the shaking of it. In, in this project, uh, Arup did the work in helping in developing those and they did a fantastic job. And then we, we, we evaluate the building using three different events of shaking. The service level of earthquake, like I mentioned before, we want it to be, have immediate occupancy performance. The design earthquake, which is what the code mandates we check, no matter what we do, we want it to be life safe. And then at the risk target of the MCE or maximum considered earthquake, we want it to have a low likelihood of collapse given the shaking. If you ask me how low, what do I mean by low? The standard for a typical office building or residential tower, that number is 10% chance of collapse given this shaking. That's a notional number. We think we do better than that, but that is the minimum that we're targeting given that shaking. Since this is such a tall building with so many occupancy in it, occupants in it, we had to target a higher performance level. We call it risk category three. That has a 5% probably of of uh, collapse given the MC shaking. So we, 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 we target a higher level of performance given the number of people in the building. And these acceleration histories are developed at the foundation. And so that we shake at the building and I'll show you a, a little cartoon of this in just a, a little cartoon video of this in just a second. But before we go into the details of it, we always wanna think about and take a step back at the high level. What are the defamation control actions? Where's that ductility going to come from? We want to identify that in the building before we start anything. Very important to understand behavior. So what we what we target in these core wall type buildings is shear wall coupling beams. The, couple, the, the coupling beams over the doorways I mentioned before, those are the, those are the key ones. And the flexural reinforcement in the in the shear wall itself, meaning we want to form a plastic hinge in this very tall cantilever. Those are the two places we want to take that energy out. Members and actions that we call force control, those that we don't want to have them exceed a certain force level because they don't behave well if you do typically, we want them to remain essentially elastic. So we protect them against 
exceeding their capacities at this higher level of shaking, this MCE subar shaking. What are those actions and members? It's shear wall, shear, shear and shear wall. Not very ductile ten, uh, once you hit that, that, that level. We want to protect against that failure. The diaphragms, the, floor, the floors that the inertial loads are derived from, and mainly the diaphragm at a transfer between the high rise portion and the base. A lot of forces and demands happen there. And the collectors, which is a subset of the diaphragm that collects the loads and drags it into the seismic force resistance system, in this case, the shear walls. And the other elements we want to essentially ask are the foundations. It's hard to fix a foundation. Clearly the columns, because the columns hold gravity load, and the basement walls, because that protects us from the dirt that comes, that would kind of collapse the building from the ground level in. And we look directly at the design gravity floors to be essential elastic for SLE and life safety, meaning we, we, we can still maintain gravity support at the MCE sub R level. So something that's very clear that we've got to keep the building up. That's a very crucial uh, goal of ours that the gravity system can support itself at the MCE sub R shaking level. So here's a little cart, uh, image of, 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 of a ground shaking. This Salesforce tower, we one of the many ground shaking hazards we put through it. Um, you can, this is really right out of the model. And then we put uh, kind of shade a little bit to give you an idea of, of how it moves and behaves. Uh, be aware that the shaking on this one is about amplified like a hundred times. It's not really moving that far. <laughs> it's not moving inches, but it's moving feet. It's not moving hundreds of feet like this diagram would, or this image would potentially show. So this is just a one image or, or video of what we do. And then we analyze all the components in the building for each of those ground motions to make sure they all meet the acceptance criteria that has been established to make sure that they get work the way they want to work. So I'll give you a few images of what those things look like and what they are. And before I leave this image here, note that this core, and I forgot to mention earlier, is big down low, but at this level right here, we lose half of it. And half of it because the elevator stopped right here. And so you'll notice that you'll see a, a behavioral difference right at this location. And I'll see it in the next slide. It'll be very obvious to you. There it is here. You can see an elevation. This is where this elevator core stops. This one continues up. And you can see here, this is the story drift plot. And so our target story drift plot is for any one of these peak, either for the short or long period shaking, we got to be less than this line, which we are. These, these dots here are less than this line. And, uh, and this is the peak of any ground motion that we, we evaluated. And these are the average of all the ground motions for the long period suite and the short period. I won't go into detail about that. These averages can't be anything more than 2.4% in this, in this case, which were well under, well under the 2.4 on the average. So this big actual building is behaving very well, except the fact that we get this really big kink right here. And we knew this was gonna happen. There's no way around it, guys, because when you stop half the elevator core at this level, you can have a kink because you lost half of your capacity right there. And so we knew this and we, when we, we deal, detailed it so that we'll be just fine. As I mentioned before, we have these coupling beams, the beams of, above these door openings. Here's a coupling beam here, here, and here. Um, these are actually tests that were done at UCLA back in the late, this is about 2007, 2008 by Professor John Wallace. Uh, the black is the test results. The blue is our representation of it. And so um, we try to mimic as close as we can uh, take that black is testing, blue is us. And we try to put it into our model and be, to be as consistent with the testing as we can to make sure that we're matching the tests to the real analytical model. I mentioned that earlier, the, the important synergy between the test results that we see in the labs to what we actually put in the computer models, they have to be as close together as we can make them. So here's a result of the coupling beams. These are, these are concrete coupling beams. Again, our acceptance criteria line is right here. We can go up to 5% rotation on the coupling beams before they are of any concern. And you can see here, these coupling beams didn't exceed 1%. At 1%, they're almost elastic. Not quite, but they're almost elastic. So these coupling beams are not working that hard, even though they're the primary 
resisting element in the building, at least these concrete ones are. When the concrete coupling beams aren't strong enough, then we go to steel coupling beams. We put steel within the concrete beam that's above these openings in some locations because they have a lot larger capacity. And they have the same rotation capability though as, as their acceptance criteria. So we put them in where needed. Uh, and you can see here that most of them are within the 1% or one half percent range. A couple of them were working really hard, but still well within the targeted 5% acceptance criteria. So again, buildings performing very well and the coupling beams in this case are doing more work than the, their concrete counterparts. Then we look at another metric. We look at more than this, but I'm just showing you a highlight of the, of the key metrics that we look at. These are the shear wall strains. The, uh, the zero line is right here. This is the strain in the concrete in compression. Green is the strain in concrete compression. The purple is the strain in the rebar in tension. I'll focus first on the green, the compression strains in the concrete. Uh, 0 0.003, you could argue we don't have to confine it at all because you're below the strain for which unconfined concrete can work just fine. That's not what we do. We can find it uh, where we think it's appropriate. We especially can find it, I'll show you in a second, where and why. Uh, so we're not even close to the limit or the exception criteria for, for concrete and compression, which is good, which is good because concrete blowing up in compression, it's not a good behavior. The purple is a strain in the rebar, like I mentioned. This line here is one epsilon yield. This is two epsilon yield. This is three. In reality, you can go up to 20 epsilon yield. We don't go up that high. We typically target five epsilon yield as our main target number, which would be right over here. We don't even have it as a line because we didn't get, get close to it. But you can see typically at a, as a cantilever building sticking out of this podium structure right down here, out of the ground, the majority of the strains would typically be down here. This is where the plastic hinge would normally form. And the highest strains would be down here in the rebar. As you can see, they're not, they're big-ish than the ones around, but not very big at all. But there's still a hinge here, so we ductly type this whole zone just because mother nature, we want mother nature to, to prove us wrong. So we wanna make sure it's ductly tied up so that we do that down here. We knew this at the outset, and I mentioned to you guys earlier, we knew that another hinge would form up here, guys. The strain is going to be high just because of this irregularity, the setback. You can see it. You can see the strains are high. We're forming a hinge right in here. So we ductly tie up all these levels as well to make to make sure that the, the concrete and rebar are fully confined and can can keep the concrete together. So that's how we deal with that on a building like this. So that's kind of an overview of a building. It's much much more detailed than that, as you can well imagine. But that's where we've been doing, and that's kind of where we're at. And, and what can we do different in the future? What can we, uh, so the best thing we can do in the future is this. this. This would be the gold standard or platinum standard, if you will. If you could show an owner his or her building exactly the way it's gonna be when it's built, and then hit, hit a button, and then, oops, 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 went too far. It's not gonna work. There we go. And show them how the building's gonna respond during the shaking. What are the contents look like? Are the ceiling tiles coming down, uh, the bookshelves going over, the awning coming down, etc. If we could show an owner this, and this is how the building would look after an MCE shaking, then they can make better decisions saying, do I like that or do I not like that? Um, but this is not a tool that, this is a, this is a longer term tool. <laughs> this is a prediction for the, the way future, way far future, not what we're doing today. But I think maybe in your careers, you'll get to this point. I think this is not that far a field that you might be able to get here. I, I think for sure you'll be able to get here. This animation, that's a real animation based on real analysis and real performance targets. But what do we have today that we're working on that is truly available? The questions that we can't answer to the owners today is some very key answers is that if the earthquake comes and I have these different performance levels achieved, if I've got that far, what does it cost to repair the, the building? How much is how much is it gonna cost to repair the damage? You know, I have this damage in this cartoon, this damage in a column, what does it cost to repair it? 
Will it have casualties? Will there be people injured or possibly killed? Hopefully never, hopefully zero, but it's never zero. It's, it's always hopefully very low. And how long will my building be unusable? How long will it take for it to get repaired back to service? Right now in the performance-based seismic design, we can't answer those questions with the technique I just showed you. But there's been work on this, and I know Farzine is very familiar with this as well, and he was part of this effort as well. He helped with the whole mathematical operation of this, if I recall correctly. We won't be able to answer those questions. So what happened was, uh, I was part of the, the project called FEMA P58. It's that, that work started in 2001, and we're still working on it in 2021, and we're making progress uh, over the last 20 years. What is the process? While well, we take earthquake ground shaking, time histories, we understand and see the structural response. Then we want to be able to predict the damage. That's the key point here, the damage within the structural components in the building. And I'll argue not just structural components, but all components. I'll talk about that in just a minute. If you can understand that for a given shaking level or different hazard level, and there's different ways to think about that. Can we calculate the downtime? casualties and the cost of repair? And the answer is now we can. Now we can do this because we have tools that can do this for us. We can start answering these questions that are more meaningful to the owner than just, am I life safe or not? Because that's a more qualitative terms term. We want to have a quantitative number for them. Okay, challenge of predicting performance. There's always a challenge in everything we do in any technical endeavor. It is impossible to predict performance precisely. We just don't know it precisely. We, there's uncertainty in every step of the way. Each step entails these uncertainties I just mentioned, but that's okay. As long as you account for them, as long as you track them, as long as you can um, bring them along with the data results, that's okay because you then can do statistics on that and understand a median response, a 90th percentile response, et cetera, because you account for all the uncertainties that could happen uh, as best you can. So what does this take? It takes us the need to create not just a structural model of what the structure behaves like, but more importantly, a building performance model. A building performance model includes all the things that are damageable in an earthquake. Structural components are certainly there, but so are all the other non-structural elements. Remember, if you want to understand the, the full range of damage, full range of performance, you need to have all this damage ability built in. You need to understand what the show walls are doing, the, the glass curtain wall, the interior partitions, the elevators, the piping, and all these other things that are likely to be damaged in the event. So you have to build a, a model that's really what the architects create. <laughs> it's, it's, it's everything in the building that they would put in, what they put in and now in terms of building information model or BIM. This information can be put in very simply, they can do it now. Uh, in, a, in a different, more simple way than they did in the past. And so in the guts of this tool are what we call fragility specifications. That they're, uh, it, that's information that tells us, given a level of damage, what does it take to repair that damage? How long it takes us to repair that damage? Is that damage gonna hurt somebody? Is that damage gonna cause a red tag to be made? And if you are to repair that damage, What's a carbon footprint issue, global warming potential of that damage repair, of repairing that damage? So that's what the specification provides for us. I'll show you a couple of examples of that. Here is the specification, and here is what damage state am I in? Given this show wall panel, we discretize damage. State. Damage states are a spectrum. And, and so, but we can't do that as easy as we can by defining discrete damage states that are separated by quite a bit of what they look like in performance. So in this case, we took this wall panel and separated in the three distinct damage states. And you can see in the imagery, they're quite different levels of looking of damage. So we define the story drift for which this damage occurs. Damage state one is one and a half percent. The uncertainty, what we call this the logarithm, logarithmic standard deviation or beta is 0.2. That's the, that helps define this fragility curve. Damage state two, it looks like this, more damage. It takes 3% story drift to get to that with some uncertainty, this factor is 0.3. And for it to look really bad and need to get tor completely torn out, replaced is 5%. So 
So we look at those and we, we, we target the understanding of what the MS states is in. Again, it's a continuum, but we want to have discrete ones to, our, to identify the overall performance. We do the same thing for the repair cost. The repair cost, uh, it varies by, we don't know what exactly what it's going to be, it, but it also varies by how many square feet of repair you have. The more, the more you need to fix, the more efficient the contractor can be, the economy of scale kicks in. So we take that into account. We have range of the cost to repair the, the, uh, this wall panel. And the fewer panels you repair, the more cost, the more you repair, the, the lesser cost, and there's an interpolation in between. But since we don't know there's repair costs precisely, we, we create an uncertainty band around that information. And you see these coefficients down here that, that, that we assign to that because we don't know the cost of repair that precisely. So we need to carry that uncertainty with us. We can do the same thing. We do the same thing with repair time. We do the same thing with unsafe placards or red tagging. We do the same thing associated with global warming potential or CO2 emissions as to what we actually track. So there's ways to do this. And again, every step of the way, we take into account this uncertainty because that's important to do because we can't precisely predict it directly. So again, we go back, we still need to do our structural analysis. It, it's, it's the fundamental basis for, for all this assessment. Again, here's a picture of a time history acceleration, the building that we're gonna shake. Uh, and then we want to understand uh, some, in, some different params like peak round acceleration, drift ratios, and a whole host of other things. So, Again, it's still rooted in our basic analysis uh, lexicon and what we're what structural engineers are very good at. Uh, we want to then ascertain median values of peak story drift, floor acceleration, and floor velocity. These are the three reactions of a building that causes damage, with the most important one being story drift, that causes most damage to the most elements within a building. So the, the the smaller your storage drift will be in a, an event that you're looking for, the less damage you'll have. Those big mechanical equipment that are bolted to the floor, those are sensitive to floor acceleration. So you have to be mindful of that. And elements tipping over like bookcases and things like that, floor velocity is a key element there. So you need to track the median responses for all that. Then we want to go about and calculate the performance. What we do is a Monte, Monte Carlo process using that information we got from our analysis and a, a lot of other uh, effort within the tool itself. We want to create hundreds to thousands of spins uh, of, of, of actual what we think are realizations from that data that we announced we did, we create realization from them, for which we can then determine associated damp demands with those realizations. Once you have a demand, using those fragility, Specifications, you can estimate damages, the damage, what damage state you're in or likely to be in. Once you know the damage state, you know the consequences, repair costs, repair time, um, casualties, et cetera. So we look at that and do it hundreds of thousands of times. Here's a very, very overly simplified uh, flow chart of the process. What you'll notice is that each time there's a question, you are spinning the dice at each realization. As, as this first one here I showed, does craft occur? Yes or no, if it does, you go down this path and it's a very simple uh, aspect to calculate and estimate once you get that. That doesn't occur very much, you're usually down this path and you're going down to different questions and where you're at, at to some point you get and you calculate, once you determine your damage, then you talk about determining the different consequences of repair costs, repair time, what kind of red tag or an unsafe plaque if you have and whether or not you have casualties. So uh, again, a flow chart, very simple. The real flow chart is really a three dimensional one, but let's not go into those details. Now, a professor would could make you do this all by hand and you'd be doing this for 25 years. There's tools available. I, I, if not mistaken, Farzine, you created your own since last I've chatted. This is the tool that we created as part of the FEMA P58 project. It's called Performance Assessment Calculation Tool, or PACT. It's a tool that uh, you put in the building performance model data. You import your analysis results, those accelerations, the story drifts and velocities. Once you got that, all that in, which takes a long time, 
hit this evaluate performance button and anywhere between five seconds and five minutes, you get your answer or the, the assessment that you're looking for. And then once you get that, you can then examine your results. I'll show you just a snippet of what that looks for. So there's a lot that goes behind the tool. Uh, there, there are other tools out there besides this one that is free. This is again, paid for by FEMA. Your, your, yours and mainly your parents' tax dollars at work <laughs> that funded this for the last, like I mentioned, uh, 20 years. Uh, but yeah, it's free, but there's other tools that are much more sophisticated that are out there. And maybe you have tools at UCI that you develop as part of your curriculum and your PhD program to do your own work in this regard. So what does it produce? It produces outcomes like this. Here's an easy quick graph of a repair cost curves. Repair cost curves, it shows you the, the, all the binning of the results and it fits to that binning of results, a logarithmic curve to it based upon that. This 0.5 is a median result of, of the repair cost. In this case, it's almost $2 million to repair it. It will then show you which performance groups, partitions, seedlings, whatever the case may be, that is causing the damage or enhance the repair cost. So you can, it, you can interrogate what elements within the structure are the ones that are making the damage that are damageable and hence cause the repair cost. And at some point you flatline up here, that flatline has come from one of two different conditions. One, it either collapses or two, you have residual drift that's so large that the building has to be torn down and, and, and replaced. So at, at, at every curve you'll see, you'll see a flatline. There's just always a small chance, sometimes a slightly bigger chance that you actually the realization will see this condition occurring, depending on, on the design of the building. Here are casualties, both deaths and injuries, very similar kind of plots. It's, it's very, these injuries are, uh, you know, likely happened and here's a median here. The median for uh, deaths is way up here. Again, it tells you in this case, it was the bookcases, unanchored bookcases falling over and injuring people. And this is falling bookcases and uh, tall file cabinets hurting people. Again, when you get to this point here and here, that would signify the building had collapsed and anyone in the building would be either injured, likely be injured or killed type of thing. So that, again, very rare, very few realizations ever would show that. That's like, a, that's like a, the 99th percentile. And then does repair time and does the same thing. You can ascertain how long it should take to repair it. In this case, the re median repair time is shown over here in the corner is 78 days to repair the damage that was associated with, with this assessment that you were doing on the bill. And then finally, I will show you the unsafe placards. The, just to forewarn you, uh, in the pack version that we produced, overestimates significantly, in my humble opinion, unsafe placards. I think all of those that participate in this agree. And so we're working on, we have been working on fixing that and kind of reducing the likelihood of this happening. And so be as may, this shows way too many times it's going to be unsafe placarding uh, condition. So I'll leave it go with that. Okay, again, this this is what we did. We finished this in like 2013 to 2014. What, what was important about this? Well, we can provide cost benefit and decision-making analysis that an owner can understand. They can understand cost and downtime, et cetera. That's terminology that they can run calculations with, with the risk management techniques. It inherently not just quantifies the possible range performance. You can check out and understand the median results or the 90th percentile or 20th percentile. You can look at any result you want and you can, you can understand the range and, and what it means and the distance between the 90th percentile and the median result on these outcomes. It directly recognized non-structural components, as I mentioned several times. Non-structural components are the majority of damage in, in a building in an earthquake. We need to recognize that, understand that, and understand what it means to getting back into a building. And for us engineers and for owners that want to understand behavior and try to get better behavior, we can try different scenarios, different design approaches different design schemes and see what the outcome is. What, 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 what are their performances? So that kind of ended one chapter of the work that we had done. The following was that as FEMA asked us the following question. 
what do code conforming buildings look like given these metrics? What does a code conforming design result in given downtime? I mean, given repair costs, repair time, et cetera. What are we getting? No one's ever had done this in the, at least in a systematic way. Uh, researchers may have done this, but we took this technique and then started to interrogate different buildings and saying, what, did, what does a code conforming building give us? So we couldn't do every building in the world. <laughs> we did a handful of building archetype is what we call them. And these are the size and force resistance systems we interrogated. Interrogated. Steel special moment frames, reinforced concrete moment frames, steel VRBFs, steel SCBFs, and steel reinforced concrete shore walls. These are, these are the ones that are generally built in the majority of buildings, except for residential. We didn't do single family housing. We didn't do that one, um, but we did other occupancy types. So these are the buildings that we interrogated to understand code conforming building performance. We look, and we could look at a variety of occupancies. You know, what kind of occupants are in the buildings? What kind of uh, use that building is undertaken? But we only looked at two: an office building type of design or a healthcare. The office building had two risk carriers. The risk category two would signify an office building with just normal office personnel in it. The office building I work in every day is risk category two. An office building with a risk category four is an essential facility like would be in the emergency operations center. So we did those two. In healthcare, you can be a hospital, but you, that would be a risk category four. You want that to perform really well. But if you're just a medical office building where you go just to your doctor to get a checkup, that's, that's a, just a medical office building, that'd be a risk category two. So we honed into those, those two occupancies and those two risk categories to understand the impacts of the different elements of that. So what did we get? What were the resulting answers that we got? I'm gonna show you the answer initially. And we did for all, like, I'm not sure all the data because that's way too much data. I'll, I'll lose you completely by then. Here are special moment, for, still special moment frames. Here are the median results, the 50 percentile results. We interrogated a, vari a variety of intensity levels, 20% of MCE, 40, the design earthquake, the DE, 80% of MCE and the MCE itself. And what were, were, what were we evaluating? The things that we talked about, repair cost, repair time, casualty, unsafe placard, and something we included that wasn't in the initial packed consequence uh, package is repairability. What's the likelihood that something could get repaired or would be repaired because the damage wasn't too great. So you can see, if you look at what we call our design earthquake, this is what we design to every day. The repair cost is 5%, right? I mean repair cost is percentage of re the replacement cost of the building. So the repair will cost 5% of the cost to replace the building in kind. So it's a very small number relative to that. It would take 14 days to repair. Casualty rate is really small, good. The chance for an unsafe placard is very low, 8%. And the likelihood of it being repaired is really high, 97%. So performing really well the, at the design earthquake, Let's look at the MCE where we want a low likelihood of collapse. And so we can have a lot of damage there, guys, a lot of damage. In this case, the repair cost is 15% 15 of the replacement cost of the building, which is still pretty low relative to that level of shaking. The repair time is 41 days. Casualty rate is 1% of the people in the building, which is low. Probably of an unsafe placard goes up to 27%. <laughs> As I mentioned, unsafe placard percentages, I think are overestimated. And the repairability is up to 86%. So not a bad performing building given this intensity of shaking. So this was the special moment frame. I'm not gonna go through all of them. I'm gonna show you the summary of, of um, all of them now. <clears throat> this is the average repair cost. Again, median results for the same level of shaking here. Um, this is for an office type uh, occupancy in a risk category two. And you can, you can compare the different systems and how they performed. And you can see the numbers here in the table for whether it's uh, the repair costs for design earthquake, et cetera. I think it's better to see these numbers out on a plot. <clears throat> this shows the same data that's in that table and the different systems along this axis. Here are the shaking intensities along this axis. And this is a median replacement value for the re replacement cost. And as you can see, um, 
it goes up as the shaping is higher. And at some point, some of the systems start to go, oops, the pair costs get fairly high because of things like residual drift, et cetera. These things didn't collapse by and large. The collapse rate were really small, which is good. But you can see here, this is a steel BRBF. You can see the repair cost gets very high because at some point, right, or, right around the Denine earthquake, residual drift becomes a big issue for BRBFs, buckling, restrained, brace frames. And to, again, the residual drift is too high, you have to tear it down and build it again. And so that's what's happening to those. And you can see that the other range of the performances of the other systems. So we have tables and plots and charts like this in, in, a, in a document that drills really deeply into different systems, et cetera. So this is like a summary slide. So we took all these systems, guys, all the systems that we talked about, these different occupancies, and then we, we, we squished them all together and using expert opinion, that, that would be the, the team that did the research, and just kind of decided what does this mean for a generic code conforming building, regardless of system type that was selected. As you can see in this plot here, it matters what system you choose potentially, right? You see different numbers, 80% down to 8%. So we try to figure out a way to put it all together in one single table and put out our best estimate of what a code conforming building would result in. And this is this table here. This is a generalized, very general performance expectation of a code conforming building. So we wrote it down and here's our opinion of that based upon the data. The repair cost for a design earthquake, 10% of the replacement cost for the MCE level earthquake is 30%. The repair time is 45 days compared to 150 days. Casualty rates are shown here, unsafe placards, and then finally repairability. So these are the numbers that up until this was published a couple of years ago, no one had done the homework and the assessment and the evaluation to try to estimate what these numbers are. Are these numbers perfect? No, they're not. They're an estimate with a lot of smart people doing a lot of great work to try to assemble the best data available to produce these results. And that's what we what we printed as part of our documents uh, a couple of years back. <clears throat> but we're not done yet. FEMA wanted to extend this beyond and saying, can we do something else? What more can we do besides estimate a code conforming building? So in, in the light of thinking about sustainability type of uh, activities or resiliency type of activities, we want to be able to understand how long it will take to be able to get re occupancy in a building. How long can you, till you get back in so you can start to shore it up and get your belongings out and things like that? So you can reoccupy it. You can't use it, but you can reoccupy it and get, you know, start to fix things. How long it takes to be functionally recoverable, get functional recovery, meaning how long does it take? to be able to go back into that building and use it in a functional way. It's not gonna be perfect, it's not gonna be like it was pre-earthquake, but you can use it for intended purposes. A hospital can be used as a hospital. A residential unit can be used as a residential unit, et cetera. And then how long does it take to get full function? Go back to pre-earthquake conditions and you're back to normal. Uh, this is data that is not available. A lot of people are working on this. I know that different universities are doing it uh, up and down the coast. I'm aware of three or four activities. We're doing it as well and using the, the techniques that I've been, we've been building on these last 20 years. In order to understand time to get back into a building, it's just not about repair time to repair the damage you see. It's all about the other impeding factors that keep you from getting into doing the repair. And I'll show you that in just a second. And it's not just that is, it's what do you need to do and understand that you actually to reoccupy and get the functional check. So we're looking at things like the following. And this is just a snapshot of the work that this is in progress right now. This is hot up the press. So this is this flow chart was presented about two months ago. Um, and I'm sure that other universities have been looking at this. This is this is our little collective work. Think about reoccupancy and functional checks. We do our functional checks by area. That can be by each floor or by a portion of a floor. The kind of things we need to think about is the area is reoccupiable, meaning is it safe to go in? But before you know that is you have to know, is the building safe or not? Is there a red tag or not? Are there falling hazards or not? Is the overall local area around your building safe? Are there other falling hazards from an adjacent building gonna impede you to getting back in your building? Is the envelope, the exterior of the building intact? In can you get in the building? Can you access the building through stairs and egress? 
are the doors jammed, et cetera, et cetera. So we're looking at all these different checks to see what is happening that would keep you from getting back in the building, including elevators and power and water, et cetera. So it's, it's a daunting flowchart. Uh, again, it's even more detailed. This is, this is a summary view of the things that are important to understanding getting back to building the real time frame it takes, not just repair time, but the overall total downtime to getting back to building for those three different targets that we're identifying. And the key to this is really understanding the impeding factors. When an earthquake occurs, there's a lot of things that happen before you can do any repair. You, need, you have to do a post earthquake inspection. You have to have money to do the repair. You have to get financing. You got to get, you just don't do it for free. You have to get the engineers mobilized to do the review. You got to get a contractor mobilized to do the repairs. You need to have permitting done, right? You, you can't just do a repair without going through the building department and saying, yeah, you can do that repair and your repair is okay. And there's long lead items. If you damage a, 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 a mechanical chiller at the top of the building, that can take six months to get a new one. So you have to take that kind of situation into account. So, look, so this is... There's a lot more to it than this, but this is kind of again the overview of the issues that are that we're discussing and others again are doing as well. Then all repairs can only happen after these impeding sequences are dealt with. But we're thinking about something even more refined than that. What happens if we can have a subcontractor or technician to mobilize to repair the elevator? You can start that right away if you have somebody that you can call. I don't know if you know that Otis is an elevator manufacturer that's in a huge number of buildings uh, around, around the country. Call your Otis repairman. Can he or she get in and start fixing the elevator right away? They can do that without, without uh, a permit. Can you just start the cleanup process? You have typically have uh, staff, engineering staff in a build office building. You have, you have custodial staff, et cetera. Can you start the cleanup? Can you start some really simple repairs? Can you fix a plumbing leak with your engineering staff you have in every major building. So we're looking at that to help speed up the whole time for re reoccupancy, fully function, uh, uh, functional repair, functional recovery and fully functional. So we're looking at all the complexities of this and it's daunting, it can be done. There's a lot of uncertainty along the way of all these different boxes you see here. And we're, we're characterizing that uncertainty in each step of the way. So when we have an outcome that the time for full functionality takes 32 days, that might be a median result, a 90th percentile result or whatever you want. So we're characterizing this with uncertainties so we can take those statistics with us along the way. Um, this future development, which I could mention, we're working on it right now, likely available by 2022. Uh, we have, it's a two-year contract. We just started last September. So it has to be done by 2022. Um, and what it might happen, and this is a, a hope of mine and something that you may see and, and as you move in your career, we may have a new performance objective, a new code design level called functional recovery that you need to target this level of time and no more to get back into a building. Because if we want to build resilient communities build resilient buildings, this is the kind of metric that we need to start talking about. It's quantifiable, it's repeatable. Is there uncertainty with the result? Yes, but at least we have something to go by moving forward. With that, I will close and answer any questions the group might have.